Hello, I'm Wayne Rogers. I'm president of the Halifax RCCO Centre and uh, I minister music here at St. Matthew's United Church here in Halifax. And my name is Sean Whitea and I am the music director at Bethany United Church in Halifax and I'm happy to be here with Wayne Rogers for this in playing session. And we're also going to be welcoming Matthew Fraser who is uh, in Toronto but through the miracles of Zoom He's going to be with us today. We're delighted that you're here because we're talking about Organ 101, hymn play. Yes, we are. And I think hymn playing is perhaps the most important function of a church organist. How often is when we when we are in hymn playing, do we we just sort of think, oh, this is just uh, something, you know, an, another part of the service. I don't think uh, organists or our congregation realize how important No, I agree. It is, I agree. Know. Hymn playing is, is, is vital to uh, corporate worship, and it's, it's vital to the uh, important stream of music that takes place within the liturgy. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. And I mean, in organ pedagogy, sometimes service playing is often overshadowed by the organist because they feel that they should have a substantial amount of organ repertoire. So consequently, um, the hymn playing skills um, sort of get put on the back burner. Yes, they do. And, and I think we are all guilty at some point in our careers where we've spent 85% of our time rehearsing the postlude and then at the last moment we squeeze in a rehearsal of the hymns. This is true. I remember attending a, a convention uh, for the AGO in Boston in 1990, and Catherine Crozier, who was an outstanding organist at the time and was 76 years old, uh, ended up talking in a workshop. She said, the most important thing you have to do if you are going to be involved with church worship is you've got to practice your hymns. And she said, you start practicing your hymns Monday morning. Excellent. I idea. think that's a, a great idea. Absolutely. What, yeah. Sorry? Go what ahead. are the determining factors of a good instrument for service playing? And uh, realizing that every church is has uh, a unique instrument at their disposal. But some of the basic things that uh, one should consider uh, of, of when considering a good instrument, uh, a church organ should be able to accompany absolutely very vital to uh, the musical health of a congregation. Um, your instrument also should be should be able to provide good hymn leadership, its tonal resources, and also uh, your instrument at your disposal should have some uh, recital capabilities. Yes, I think it's more important uh, perhaps though that we sort of think of it that the, the, the function it serves as a worship instrument is perhaps uh, most important thing, and, and hopefully it will be large enough to have recital capabilities such as such as this instrument here and as what you have. Yes. You know? So choosing appropriate hymns is really a constant challenge. I, I, I'm sure you know you, you've gone through the same thing as, as myself when you're looking and trying to plan the season or something, and and you're saying, what are we trying to accomplish here with with our hymns? The minister I work with has a very good philosophy. She says it's all one gospel. So basically, any hymn will work uh, in, a, in a particular situation. We don't have to sort of say, oh, it's a seasonal hymn or, or, or what. But she claims it's all one gospel. And you know, she's, she's right. Because hymns are the thread that hold the service together. Um, and and that's assisted, I guess, by other uh, uh, choral music and solo music that may be uh, played uh, during the service and, uh, and, and it could be uh, parts on the Mass or what have you as well. But uh, in addition to the text of a hymn, the most other thing I think that's of significance is that the tune should be singable. It should be in a decent range. Absolutely. And um, because you want your congregation to sing, and if you have stuff that's just too high, 
uh, it's, it's impossible, or too low. I mean, it's, it's the same thing. Or too difficult. Or too difficult. Yes. That is exactly true, too. Guaranteed. Uh, church organists has responsibility to make it work. That falls on all of our hands and feet. Sure does. Our, our hymn playing should have spontaneity, rhythmic drive, whether the tempo is fast or slow. Just because the tempo is slow does not mean it is uh, without rhythmic drive. Registrations which lead the hymn singing rather than accompanying the hymn singing. And the registrations that we create should also suit the text. We often are presented with the idea of uh, word painting. And word painting has existed in choral music and uh, vocal music for centuries. And uh, uh, word painting should also exist in your hymn play. So think about the text as you read through the text and study the words. How could you paint uh, some of the sounds with your tonal choices in uh, your organ registrations? Exactly. Also, when we play, we must be aware of the punctuation within the stanzas and try to incorporate textual phrasing in our playing. I think that's so important. And sometimes we forget. Uh, and I, I, I'm guilty of that uh, sometimes on a Sunday morning and I'm reading the wrong verse or something like that, <laughs> yes. uh, you know. And we need to pace between uh, each of our verses so that we allow uh, us to physically breathe and allow the phrase to end musically of one stanza before we go into uh, another. And uh, we should always uh, see what kind of a flow we can give to the uh, to the hymn uh, and to keep and keep momentum going as you said regardless and i was just going to add to that that uh, we're talking about sound and physics and sound has to move and swirl i love that word swirl and sound has to go somewhere and not only are we accompanying but we are also listening as we're playing and we are making choices about what tempo works, how to end a phrase, um, how long we are going to take to read before we um, execute the next phrase or, or begin the ending a verse and beginning another verse. That's right. Well, let's look at a hymn. How would we go about it? So I thought what I would do is we're going to take a simple tune called Hesperus, um, and I would this is how I would go about teaching somebody how to play it. And uh, basically, we go and I am going to I work it that we learn phrase by phrase, and in most cases, like in this hymn, it's line by line. And uh, my little motto is, do everything five times each, and then add as we go. But my basic thing is we have to work and understand what our feet do and the relationship of it to the hands and getting coordination of the hands and feet. Now, for some of you, this may be old hat. For some others, it may not be. So I'm going to go right back and start from scratch. So let's look at this. Um, and I'm going to go to the console and then try to demonstrate what we will be doing. Now, with this uh, hymn, the first thing I would make sure is we start and we get the pedal. Now, this happens to be the key of F, which is great, because our feet, our, our, our right foot can fit very neatly between the E flat and the F sharp, and the left foot between the uh, C sharp and the B flat, and you can immediately feel with your toes, oh, I know where F is right away, and I know where B flat is, or C, and I, I can use that as my sort of default place. So, what I would have a student do is to take the first line and, first of all, learn the pedal. And they would do this five times. I'll do it once, but here we go. Then we would 
try five times with the pedal and the left hand. And the left hand does not play both parts. The pedal is going to play the bass line and the uh, right, the left hand, sorry, is going to play the tenor. So here we go.
base cleft, but not an extra base cleft for the um, pedal line. Um, the little triangle uh, symbols, um, just to be completely clear and transparent, those are for um, pedaling. And if the triangle is above the note, it's for the right toe. And if it's below the note, it's for the left toe. You'll notice at the ends of the, of the uh, musical lines, for example, in the first line, I've actually uh, that dotted half note, which would, you know, obviously get three counts. I'm going to think of doing that in two counts. Rest on the third beat, or lift and breathe on the third beat, so that when I go to the second line, I'm entering on the downbeat and the beginning of the measure. It's a nice clean break. It's an opportunity to breathe, and then I would be in in time on the downbeat of the second line of music. I do this at the end of the second line, at the end of the third line. At the end of the fourth line, I'm actually going to add some time here. I'm going to acknowledge the dotted um, half note there just for three counts, but then I'm also going to add um, another beat and then a rest, which we will breathe and lift on. <coughs> and then, uh, or sorry, I'm going to add two more beats and then a rest and breathe on the third beat and then come in on the down beat at the top of the music again. It's important to read through the text um, because there are subtleties in all texts that you have to be aware of. And there's a, a really uh, uh, important one here. In verse 2 on the, on the fourth line, you have the text, um, Your very body for my peace. In verse 1 and verse 3, there's commas. You are my rain, comma, my wind, comma, my sun. In verse 3, until I flower, comma, until I know. You can have little indications of those commas in your musical leadership. But in the second verse, I feel that the phrase has to continue on to the very end. Your very body for my peace. There's no comma in that phrase, and so I'm just going to carry that through. Um, and also notice that um, pretty much throughout the hymn, yes it does, the, the, the four voices uh, in accordance with each other, except for that one uh, special moment on the fourth line of music, the tenors break away, and they go from a C to a, a B flat dotted quarter, and then they hold over the beat to the end of the third beat, and they have an eighth on the eighth note. So they're they, they have a little separate rhythm moment from the soprano, alto, and bass. Okay, so I'm going to go to the organ now quickly and uh, demonstrate uh, a few of these concepts. For Now I'm going to go from the first line to the second line, 
one, two, three, one, two, lift. And then I come in on the second verse or the third verse or whatever it should be. Okay? I hope that covers most of the points that I mentioned. Okay. Now, to make this work, of course, we have to use some registrations that will be effective. And we just used one simple registration then. But if we were going to use uh, uh, different ones for this particular hymn, we probably would have started off with uh, what we were using here. We were just using principles eight. Four. That's right, yes. And then if you want, you, that would probably work very well as, as an introduction, but if you want to give your congregation some, a little bit of oomph to right. start off, you probably throw on a mixture just to give it a little bit of sparkle, and then uh, that will sort of get them enthused and start singing. Then on your next verse, your second verse, you can back off, because I know with my choir, my choir sings in unison, on the first and last verses, and we go into harmony on the other verses. So it's nice to back Bring it down a bit, you can hear those voices So that up. you can hear it, you can hear the parts singing. Uh, now, on uh, registration changes can be made very simple. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to get complicated. For instance, just going from verse one to verse two, just cut a mix to it. Maybe on verse three, you might want to add the super degree or the choir super degree or something or choir yeah super degree and or maybe another mixture than what you had in verse one and then in verse four depending how big that verse is because my choir goes in unison and usually that's the strongest uh, verse it tends to be right uh, for for most hymns uh, you would go with probably a full chorus to the mixtures, and then if you really wanted to get excited, you could go and add some nice um, 1684 reads right. uh, to, to give it some real uh, oomph. And, uh, but I always try to make sure that even though it appears that sometimes it, I'm, they probably think I'm playing too loud, I can still hear the congregation right. far off. Now, the one thing I think that I've found with, with a lot of organists over the years is that they play for themselves. And they only play to the volume that it suits them and they can hear everything around them. I never do that. I try to think of, can the person in the back row feel comfortable right. singing right. and give them a sound bath? Not, not necessarily a heavy one, but... Uh, but so often, especially with if we've got electronic organs and, and the speaker systems are right into the console, right. sometimes we lose track of that and we tend to only play to what we, what we hear and think, oh, we're playing too loudly, and you go two pews down in the church and you can't hear. Right. So you've got to basically get someone to sit and play the instrument and you go down to the back of the church or various spots, parts of the church and listen to the sound and see how that works at a balance and say, could I sing to this? Right. Does that make sense? And one other detail I just want to add quickly is that all, all these are wonderful ideas. You can also um, control the color, control your sound palette with the expression pedals. Many of us have opportunities to use expression pedals. So if we want to go to that fourth verse, if we want to pull on the reeds, and we want to save just a little bit for that last phrase, we yep. can have that have the scroll box maybe closed halfway and then just open it as we approach that end and it's another opportunity to, to change your color palette uh, as you're as you're presenting your hymn to the congregation. I totally agree. Totally agree. And for softer for hymns such as Ferris Lord Jesus or something oh, like sacred, that. Oh sacred head. Yeah. Silent you, night. You would want silent night. You would not want to be playing with a full bright organ sound, but for, for more, if, if those would be more reflective, and I think you could probably go for the flutes, and, and you can keep it light and bright uh, with the flutes, but the one thing is tubby registration. And that must be a Newfoundland expression, is it? What's that? Tubby. Tubby, I guess so. <laughs> I've heard that for, for a while, maybe. But I know what it means, and it makes perfect sense. Yes, yes. Really fat sound does not work, you know. Uh, we, we, 
clarity to cut through. Right. And my little motto has always been, if I pull, pull a stop and I can't hear it, don't use it. No, because you, you're, adding to, you're, you, you're adding to the confusion. That's it. You're getting it tubby. Yes. Yeah. You're getting it tubby. That's, yeah. that's the thing. You know. But anyway. Uh, alternate harmonizations yes. is, a, is another wonderful uh, uh, thing that uh, organists can do with their hymn playing to inspire congregation singing and even inspire the organists themselves as they, as they are presenting this hymn for worship. Um, the, the Holy Spirit moves through us at different moments and we, we may go off in different uh, moments of extemporization, improvisation. And so alternate harmonizations, alternate harmonizations is another way to enhance him playing, whether you create your own or use arrangements, new harmonies, especially to the last verse of a familiar tune, always heightens the hymn singing experience, especially in the last in the last verse, uh, making it fresh, making it new once again. Isn't that a wonderful opportunity when, when somebody in your congregation has sung a hymn for uh, decades and then you've, you've uh, added something to the to the sound and they and they speak to you afterwards and said never heard it played that way and, and it was so inspiring. Yep. So that's that's part of our craft, part of our responsibility as, as leaders of uh, hymn singing. And some of us are more gifted than others to be able to create harmonizations on the fly. Right. And so uh, for those of us that can't, uh, now I do a lot of my own uh, arrangements if I can't find right. some other poetry, but um, here is some resources for alternate harmonizations of hymn tunes. I think perhaps the, the one that's been most influential over the past 25 years is probably Noel Ross. Right, yes. He started off with 200 last verses. And all of a sudden, then another book came out, um, more last verses. Right. Now those two have been put together and have become 400 last verses, and apparently there's another book out now as well that he has written, but his his arrangements are generally really well done. They fit into the keys that we are used to now. And what I like about his arrangements is it's it's not too much. And I've heard an a, a organ instructor say there can be too much, and again it creates confusion exactly. over bearing to um, the congregation of singing. I've heard it described in different analogies. One that I like over the years is, is uh, the ice cream sundae, and you want just enough chocolate sauce, and just enough exactly. toppings, and just enough cherry, and not too much. Otherwise, it just moves us with too much musical information. Exactly. Yes. No, yeah. I always try to make sure that all the harmonizations I use, you can always hear the melody. Right. And still lead your congregation on and then throw in those wonderful chords like the right. David Wilcox, yes. O Come All Ye Faithful. He stays true to the tune, but boy, there's what we call that chord in the organ world. And that's an excellent point you made. If, if the melody gets lost in all the mix, uh, chances are your congregation will stop singing and yeah. then you, you've lost your purpose of yeah. what you're about. And the purpose of this is to enhance them and to want them to sing more. No, that's the thing. That's the first page. There's some more uh, 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 settings that you, you can buy. Some of them perhaps are a little out of uh, date now, but they are probably some, available. <laughs> some, some have survived the test of time they more than others, but it's right. always good to explore. Yeah. Just for those of you who wanted to see, uh, this is an old Rossthorn arrangement of uh, Abbott's Knee. Uh, it's a it's a great arrangement. I use it myself, and uh, and sometimes you know there will be you'll find you will find arrangements and you say I don't like that chord there. I'm going to substitute it with this chord, and if it works, you do it. I mean that's what it's all about. Do a do a little rewriting. Do a little on your Saturday rewriting. rehearsal, and then you can use it on God. Sunday morning. That's yes, correct. Yes, that's it. But, you know, so I basically think that that sort of looks after what we want to say. Right. We're delighted. Now, if you want to hear extemporization, uh, we've got a recording that Matthew Fraser, uh, who is presently studying music at the University of Toronto and studying with Dr. Patricia Wright, 
uh, he has uh, recorded two hymns uh, of different, two contrasting hymns, and he is uh, going to just improvise on the fly uh, compared to what I perhaps would do. I have to have mine all written out, but he, he has this ability to, to he has do this. this gift going on for That's himself. That's right. He loves improvising. Yep, and so we're going to listen to that right now, and then as soon as that's over, we are going to go to live question and answer. Thank you. Thank you.